Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning uh, to wherever you're tuning in around the world. Welcome to the session on the, the Canadian photonics industry landscape. My name is Dolma Novak, and I'm from Octane Wireless. I'll be the co-chair of the session, along with Erin Young from Apple. And this was actually the last session of today's industry program being held as part of the IEEE uh, Photonics Conference for 2021. And our original plan was that we would be uh, meeting in Vancouver and listening to these talks, but we still have an opportunity to showcase Canada virtually. Uh, and we're very pleased to welcome you today for uh, this two hour session. And we will have six speakers who uh, come from different organizations and they will be giving their perspectives about uh, how um, they have contributed to the global photonics industry. So I would like to uh, let everyone know that we will have time after each talk for some questions from the audience. You can either type in your question directly into chat or you can um, raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself and ask the um, speaker directly. So uh, please let me welcome the first speaker of today's session, who is Steve Alexander from Siena. And he is Senior Vice President and uh, CTO. And he will be talking about Canadian photonics and Siena capacity for the world. So over to you, Steve, thank you. Dama, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that it's, uh, full screen, off to go. Um, so I picked this capacity for the world title because I, I um, feel very strongly that, you know, the, the technology that comes out of the Canadian photonics industry does in fact feed that. Um, when you look at Sienna's business, and if you're not familiar with us, this is the, you know, the public tagline, right, a networking system services and software company. Um, but we do provide a tremendous amount of connectivity and capacity out to service providers, whether you're kind of the classic telecommunication service provider, what we call the web scale folks, the hypergiants. Um, you know, we got started back in 92, funded in 94, uh, and the initial product was dense wavelength division multiplexing. It was the first, you know, high scale DWDM product that was um, available in the marketplace. And it really did start, a, um, as, as one of the folks said way back then, Sienna introduced photonics to Wall Street, which is an interesting way of thinking about what happened. It was considered an interesting technology, but not necessarily a separate marketplace. And with the um, uh, beginnings of Sienna, the impact that the first sets of products had on the, the industry, it really did open some eyes as to the benefits of photonics and what it meant for you know, the expansion of the internet, additional connectivity and capacity. And so you can get a sense of you know, 7,000 people across a number of different countries, 85% um, of the world service providers being supported and such. When you look specifically at Canada, and this is where the, the heart of the photonics pieces come from, um, 2,200 Canadian employees is about half of the overall R&D team. And it came to us through a series of very strategic acquisitions dating all the way back to almost 15 years ago, um, Akara, Katina, um, Nortel is Nortel came apart. We were fortunate to be able to win the bidding for what was in the Metro Ethernet Networks piece, but that was the, the Photonics guys, the Photonics Systems folks. And since then, we were also able to add um, Teraxian, a portion of Teraxian, which was actually very vital to the next step of the evolution of um, optical communication systems, which is the miniaturization, the reduction in size, increase in performance and such. And we maintain three R&D centers between um, Ottawa, Montreal, and uh, Quebec City. And so I, I don't think I can say enough good things about the talent um, that this represents both to Siena, but you know, arguably more importantly for the whole, uh, the whole world, the entire industry. They pioneered what has become kind of de facto way of communicating, which are the coherent systems, right? So you know, if you look at um, the change in the, the industry over the last few decades, you can identify a couple, and I'll have a chart here in a second to kind of highlight some. But the, the most significant one in, let's say, in the last 10 years has been the rise of coherent systems. And it's what allowed us to rapidly scale up capacity, 200, 400, 800. You know, that 800 gig is now the state of the art in terms of what's shipping in volume. And there's a, pretty much a direct line of sight to what's going to be available in terms of terabit sorts of systems in the future. And that same technology base that 
that does these high performance systems, the 800 gig systems that you know can cross an ocean sort of thing, is very similar. It's ba basically the same technology base that drives the size reduction and creates the pluggables marketplace. And so much of what you see here can be tied back to the, the fundamental technologies that came out of the Canadian photonics industry. So it's, it is really a global phenomenon. Um, the combination of dense wavelength division multiplexing, so kind of Sienna's first product back in the middle 90s, plus coherent detection, which is the 2010 kind of addition from the, the um, Nortel MEN group. If you look at that top left network capacity chart, you know, we can kind of lay claim to being amongst the first to get us from that blue curve, which was the old just straight intensity modulated world to the combination with the dense wavelength division multiplexing. And then the movement from the green curve to the red curve, right? Where you're now combining both DWDM and coherent. This has driven a tremendous reduction in cost. Um, you know, if I can, for the same size of silicon, drive twice as many bits through it, by using the correct kind of you know signaling formats so the kind of modulation all of a sudden i can cut basically the cost per bits in half and we've been able to do that generation over generation over generation and i'll have a better slide here in another couple of minutes but there's been dramatic reductions in space power overall complexity as a result of this and so this combination of dwdm and coherent has really become it's basically the pervasive photonics technology across all applications now um, what we call multi-haul, which is the metros off to the long distance systems that are terrestrial submarine systems. They created an entire marketplace around upgrading, you know, in, installed submarine systems. Data center interconnect, fiber in the access, fiber deep 5G. There's even issue, initiatives around coherent pond. One of the places it hasn't penetrated quite as far, and there's a lot of work going on in this space right now, is inside of the data center or the intra data center space. But elsewhere in the world, coherent plus WDM is generally the de facto standard for you know, how you make connections, how you drive cost out, how you drive um, connections and capacity up. And, and what's been really interesting to watch is as the different generations came out, the adoption rate has actually increased, right? And, you know, but if you go back a little bit with 40 gig, it took almost five years to get that technology out. And we just happened to use a number of 5,000 units deployed. Um, 100 gig, just under three years, 200 gig, under two years. By the time we got to 400 gigs, less than a year. So every time there was a incremental addition of capacity, tremendous reduction in the time to deploy. People got familiar with it. They understood the ease of using it, the benefits of it, the performance that you could get. And this is true, whether it was the module, which is typically where the high performance optics are held or the pluggables, the CFP DCOs and the QSP, QSFP DDs. Um, all of those get very rapid technology adoption cycles now. And it, do, it does truly go on a global scale. What we did here, and this is probably almost a year old now, just in terms of watching how all these things got deployed, where in the world did the technologies go? And it's actually instantiated into um, networking equipment that is typical for a central office, you know, where it tends to be more modular and more vertical, not so deep, and also for a data center where you tend to be much deeper, looks more like a server, operates much more like a server. Same basic technologies play directly into both and you can actually interwork across them. So it gives you a way to bridge between what has kind of been the classic telco world as well as this rapidly emerging, you know, the web scale world and how they connect and how they interoperate is, is key to making this entire, you know, global infrastructure operate so seamlessly and so coherent and the ability to build systems out of it in a, in a very effective and usable way has been key in just enabling that kind of growth on a, on a global basis. So these basic technologies originating in Canada really do feed the world in terms of global capacity and connectivity. Um, this is one that I particularly like. This was the first live 800 gig network. So again, it speaks to if we're going to connect the world, let's go a long way. Um, this was Southern Cross, and it carries the majority of the traffic out of Australia and New Zealand coming up to the U.S. Um, they specialize in high-capacity resilient bandwidth services. Um, they had the first live 800 gig streams on the planet. But what was really interesting to see here is if you go back historically, if you're familiar with how submarine systems kind of have evolved, when Southern Cross was first put in um, to today, the advent of coherent combined with WDM has upgraded the capacity just about 80 times from its original design potential. Now that's just 
an incredible improvement in performance if you go back to think about what they thought they first had. Being able to walk in and say, we now have developed a technology that can get you, you know, almost two orders of magnitude bigger performance, longer economic life than what you may have first thought. I mean, think about the impact that that has on, you know, the, the industry and the ability to connect. And just to place this in the global context again, um, this is some of the work that telegeography does, just kind of tracking the amount of connectivity between the, the major continents. And you get a sense of as impressive as what we did with um, Southern Cross is, it's just a small portion of the globe's, you know, real connectivity and capacity demands. And you know, I still run into when I when I go to conferences and you go outside the, the technical area and you're over at you know a Starbucks getting the coffee, getting people saying, you know, submarine conference, you're talking about submarines or you know, the internet, well, that's still satellites. No, this is it. This is you know 99.99% of the world's connectivity is all these submarine cables, and they're all you know fed with photonic technologies, many of which have now come out of the, the Canadian operations of Sienna. So it's something that um, the industry should be proud of, Canada should be proud of, the folks that contributed to all this should be very proud of. Now, one of the best acquisitions that we have done was um, a portion of Taraxium, and we, that brought in-house some key photonic technologies. Now, it wasn't that we couldn't go buy these things on the merchant market, you absolutely could, but there becomes a point in time where to make continue, continued advances, um, you get to a system on a chip kind of concept, and that's really where the industry is now. We can put entire systems onto individual chips, and to do that well, and to control the cost, control the performance, control the supply chain, everybody knows about supply chain issues right now, um, it's good to have that in-house. And what was one of the, the, the nicest things about the folks from um, Taraxian is they came to us with an understanding about multiple material platforms. And Sienna kind of by design, um, my DNA falls this way, the company's DNA falls this way, is we're not um, religious about individual technologies. We believe in picking the one that is best for the right application requirements, whether it's performance or level of integration or, inter you know, or economics. And so having the ability to work in indium phosphide, silicon photonics, and others, which is others that we haven't even taken advantage of yet, um, really did give us some, some uh, advantages in the marketplace. And it drove the kind of things you see here, the ability to do um, full coherent receivers our own, complete coherent drivers and modulators, transceivers on a chip. This is what drove the space size power, you know, down performance up, really did change the game in terms of what we could do from an overall system point of view. This is the chart I referred to or, or earlier. When Sienna came to market in 96, um, 16 wavelengths of two and a half gigabit was our first product. That's 40 gigs total. That took one full telco bay. So 400 gig would require 10 of those things, right? So 10 bays worth of complexity of photonics, of lasers and modulators and detectors and fiber bright gratings is what we first use. Lots of complexity to make all that thing work. Well, okay, what can you do today? And, you know, I brought one just, you know, here it is, right? That's one of the 400 ZRs from the, from the OIF. And inside of that are all Sienna technologies, many of which came out of Taraxian along, you know, with the DSPs that the folks from Ottawa did. And you look at the change here, this is a tremendously dramatic improvement in space, power, complexity. This is what is going to enable our industry to put, you know, 400 gig everywhere, right to the edge of the network, 800 gig in the future, terabits beyond that. So this drives, you know, really some changes. Now, one thing I will tell you from, and again, I'm from the US, right? So I work out of our headquarters off, office here, which is in Hanover, Maryland, and I date back to when we started the company. But I can tell you my experience with our um, Canadian family members of our partners and such, right? The, Canada has wonderful um, ability to provide relationships that are mutually beneficial between uh, technical organizations like a Siena and universities. Um, programs like MyTax, that I think is just as, as good day as they exist in the world. Um, we have great relationships by, by virtue of the MyTax program and others. There's, there's others that we can take advantage of and there's direct relationships with various faculty around. This gives you a sense of, of many of the ones that we work with. And I wanna give you a couple of examples of the work that we do. But at least in my experience, it is unique in the world, um, better than many of the other places that we, you know, have what you'd call kind of, you know, an academic and then um, commercial relationship and such, right? 
And just some examples of what we've been able to do here um, between CN and, and University of Toronto work on high voltage silicon based driver amplifiers. So you need these sorts of things if you're going to do miniaturization and you're going to drive the optoelectronics and such, right? It, test and circuits, right? The ability to go in, and this was with the University of Ottawa, and measure the performance of the fiber, um, phase interpolation, measure the nonlinearities, understand what's going on right down to the physical layer. You know, the, the networks of the future are going to be sensor platforms as much as anything else. And the ability to just measure all the parameters, uh, you know, right down to the physical layer, all the analog, all the digital is so critical to making high performance systems. Um, and I don't want to give you the sense that we only do coherent because clearly we know about the direct detection. Also, here's a different way of looking at it from work that we did with McGill to, you know, just investigate other uses of direct detection, including what we call self-coherent. We actually send what effectively looks like the local oscillator along with the uh, transmitted signal, which is kind of clever. So it gives you a sense of what's going on. And it isn't only just devices, by the way. Um, AI is going to play a bigger and bigger role in what we do in terms of networks and infrastructure, building the global fabric, um, looking at what the network health is, you know, knowing what's healthy means you can figure out when it's not healthy, right? And so understanding all that about what's actually out in the network and how it's performing is so critical to the future state of things. So we also work with, in this case with a couple of different universities on machine learning and such. So I just want to take a couple more minutes because I, I want you to understand um, the potential benefits here because there's going to continue to be huge trends that drive this industry, the photonics industry, the communications industry, the networking industry. This is just some of them that are on here. Um, I'll speak in particular, you know, what's going on just from connecting objects, cloud, some of the things on fiber deep and such, but there's many just fundamental driving um, forces that are going to keep things going very well for, you know, the communications industry. You know, networks in general, writ large, have to adapt to what we think of now as just unprecedented scale. You know, we talked a little bit about capacity and connectivity. In rough numbers, there were more devices on net than people on Earth as around 2014. And you look historically about how we thought about networks from an architectural point of view, what we needed from capacity and connectivity. It started with connecting places. That's your way, you know, the original phone line systems were that way, right? Then we got into connecting people. Well, that was the wireless revolution. Now we're kind of connecting machines. We're hanging everything we can onto these networks. Well, all those machines are capable of running that many more virtual machines, right? Just think of all the virtual machines that sit inside of your smartphone. You know, you're not carrying ca cameras and compasses and date books and calendar books and all this anymore. It's all there, right? To all, all those applications and they're all connected. And so it's just unprecedented scale is what networks have to deal with. And there is continuous network transformation going on right now, whether you're in the wireless industry where you're looking at 10 to 100 times higher data rates, one tenth the latency, you know, 10 times the coverage. If you're in the cable industry where you're now pushing fiber as close to that end customer as you can. So, you know, the coax is literally just the last drop or the ability to take coherent to the edge. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, 400, the ZR, 400 ZR, that done correctly, meaning interoperable with the right training, the right experience and such, drives coherent everywhere. So 400 gig can literally go any place there's fiber. In fact, now when we talk to people about fiber, we say, okay, terabits are sitting there. How are you going to light it? There might be good reasons they only light it at gigabits, but the potential to light it at terabits is sitting there right in front of them. And this is an interesting chart. What I did is I took um, some of the work from Ethernet Alliance, our friends at the Ethernet Alliance, and I extended it. And I highlight a couple of things on here. You know, one is how long it took us to get the evolution of, you know, Ethernet done, right? Six rates took 35 years. You know, in the last three years, we've had six new rates all the way up to 400 gig E, right? And these are rates typically you think of as the edge of the network. Now, the um, Ethernet Alliance folks extended out to the 800 gig and the 1.6. Well, conceivably, we're already at 800 gig, at least on the long haul systems. 1.6 is kind of coming next. But if you say that silicon is going to continue to advance, and I put the silicon node technology across the top there, you can get a sense of where this can go to, right? So 3.2, 6.4 are reasonable places to think we're going to be getting to in the next decade or so. And keep in mind, these are what we typically think of as being out at the edge of the network. This is quote Ethernet, right? The LAN of quote Ethernet, mm -hmm. right? So the photonics is going to have to keep up with this. And we have every reason to believe that that is going to be able to. In fact, when you look at the types of service growth, and this is, you know, some of the work that Omdia does, you know, projecting it out, tremendous amount coming on video, if you sum up all the different video pieces there, but you're then starting to see the emergence of the virtual reality traffic, 
just straight communications traffic, but you get a sense of just the amount of growth here, right? You know, we as a society are learning how to use up, you know, network capacity and connectivity, just like we've learned how to use up, you know, disk space and memory, right? It's just, you want more, just get more and off you go. And so, you know, we're very confident that this trend is going to continue. And especially when you look globally again, you know, remember the model here is basic photonic technologies coming out of Canada, coming up through the systems engineering capabilities of Siena, going out into the world, providing all this kind of connectivity and capacity. Where would you expect lots of growth? Well, places where haven't been very well connected, for example, Africa, tremendous compound growth that we see there. And even, you know, in something that is fair, fairly mature in terms of its telecom infrastructure, like the US and Canada, still double digit growth, 20, 25% that we see in, you know, on kind of year on year, which is just dramatic when you think about what that means. And then if you go and say, okay, how does that translate down into photonic solutions? Here's some work that like counting did just in terms of, again, back to ethernet, because it's an easy thing to understand and, you know, sits out at the edge of the network and lots of people play in that space. But you're gonna get a sense of the kinds of rates that people are looking at 400 gig, right? 2023, 2024, 400 gig may turn out to be the dominant rate out of the edge of the network. Now, the clear dependence on other pieces of software and automation, and you know, training, getting people you know, comfortable with it. But you can see where this can go in terms of just rolling out connectivity and capacity for the world. So I, I can't um, give a talk like that without at least saying, okay, what, what's of interest next, right? From the perspective of, you know, Sienna sitting here building out these kind of capabilities. And I would say, look, there, there are the usual suspects, right? You want improvements on lasers and modulators and detectors, and that will continue. Um, I often get asked about Shannon Limit. Um, what I would tell you is if he was around today and he looked at the problems that we have in our industry, he would just say, go get a better channel. Not to him, don't forget the channel is the fiber channel, not the WDM channel, it's the channel. So he would just say, go get a better channel because the real limit is you know, the Erbium amplifier. Um, on the fiber side, well, how about hollow core? You know, if nonlinearities is the problem and, you know, nonlinear Shannon limit is really the issue, well, get rid of it. Get rid of the, the silica core and then off you go with a hollow core. And then how about on sources? You know, if we're really sending all these terabits and petabits, why don't we just light the whole fiber up at once instead of doing channel by channel by channel by channel? Can we just do the whole thing? Um, one place that I think the industry needs to step up is going to be reliability of photonics. There's a lot of activity on co-packaging. When you look at what has to happen there, the basic photonic components have got to get down into fit rates that are in single digits. And I think it's an opportunity to prove it that it really can get there. And then, of course, there's, you know, the beginnings of things on quantum communications and the like that are, are of great interest um, that always seem to be 10 years away, but still of great interest to folks. So with that, I believe that is my yep, that is my last chart. I will stop the share so I can see if there are any questions or comments and off we go. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for that great perspective on Sienna's uh, activities um, in Canada. So we have time for um, one or two questions from the audience. You can either put it through into chat um, I don't see any yet, or um, if anyone wants to just uh, directly unmute themselves, you can go ahead. If not, maybe I'll, I will uh, start the question. Uh, Steve, I have a question about, um, I know it's a little bit difficult to do crystal ball balling, but you showed that dramatic reduction and swap with the, the transceiver size. Do you ever think about what may be the possibility in the future in terms of the size of that transceiver and the and the bit rate? Oh, sure. And this and um, it's a great question because it gets into the ideas around the co-packaging and such, right? Because you'd really like to, you know, if you think about how, how all these things run, you're sitting there, you know, inside of the chip, you know, basically with a parallel representation of everything. We do a tremendous amount to then serialize it and spit it out on the, the fiber line. Um, there's a lot of interesting work. One of the, one of my guys is interested in a, pro, a program that actually in the U.S. DARPA is funding um, called Pipes, which is about petabit interconnects. And so, yes, we think about it a lot because I think once you get to something like the hundred terabit chip era, you're going to need photonic interconnect at that point. And there's a debate, you know, does it stay pluggable? Is it the is it the field replaceable unit? This gets back to my comment around. Can we prove the fit rate of these things is low enough that it can be co-resident on, but effectively is the electronics platform or not, right? So yes, we, we think about it a lot. Um, the numbers look very promising, other than we have to work on the reliability portion of it. 
And do you have a time frame at all? Do you try to set a time frame for that? I would like it to be five years or under. I, I have a worry that it's going to take longer. Thank you. Sure. Any other? Oh, there is a question from um, Matt Posner, uh, if I can ask that for him. Um, there's an increasing awareness of the environmental cost of data. What are the trends in power consumption and the technology? Will we be developing sustainably? What is, so over time, yes. In fact, if you go back and you look, um, I don't put it on that chart, which has this physical size, but you're talking about a, re a reduction in power consumed to do 400 gig over the last you know 20 something years. That's a couple of orders of magnitude because the 400 ZR is somewhere between 15 and 20 watts, depending upon where you get it from. The original Sienna kit would have been kilowatt class plus for that sort of capability. So there's been dramatic reductions. Now, what we're of course doing is we're using it as fast as we can, you know, reduce it, right? And so the, the total um, consumption is actually rising. So yes, we're, we're very sensitive to it. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're so interested in things like the DARPA pipes program, because their goal is, you know, a 10 X to hundred X reduction in, you know, energy per bit required for these kind of interconnects, which again, drives directly to kind of overall energy usage for this kind of, you know, fabric. Thank you. And we have um, just one last question from uh, Maria Dejane. Um, in terms of competing with China, how well are we doing right now? And what about five years down the road? Um, so I'd say right now we're doing well. Um, five years, it's going to be a real question mark because China has, does not at the moment have the capabilities to do in-house um, the high-end DSP and the silicon photonics and the other pieces of it. They have national objectives to get there. You know, they graduate more engineers than any other country. They put more money behind, you know, their investments than anybody else. So it's, it's, it is a worry. No doubt. It is a worry. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much for your questions. And thank you again very much, Steve, for your uh, great presentation. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the next speaker today, who is uh, Madison Rilling. And uh, she's Director of Talent and Outreach at Optinique. Uh, and she will be talking about um, the business of Quebec Photonics. So um, over to you, Madison, thank you. Thank you so much, Dalma, for the, for the invitation, for the introduction. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here speaking with all of you and to be among the, this uh, amazing group of, of panelists today. Um, I'd just like to start off by acknowledging that I'm joining all of you from Quebec City, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Huron-Wendat people. I know that we're all joining or gathering from different places, and I would like to extend an invitation to each of you to mindfully recognize and learn about the longstanding history of the land on which you reside today. So like Dalma introduced you, I will be speaking on behalf of Updanik, which is Quebec's photonics cluster, and I'll be speaking about more the, the landscape of business of Quebec photonics. So in case there are some interna international attendees today and you're not too familiar with where Quebec is on the map, I just wanted to, to point you out the province of Quebec here that you see in blue. Um, so interestingly, inter interestingly enough, uh, the province of Quebec is home to the highest concentration of a certain kind of expert in the country. Um, so some of you might be thinking, what is that poutine experts or <laughs> maple syrup experts? But, but no, it's, all <laughs> it's also, um, uh, the highest concentration actually of optics and photonics experts in the country. And um, like you actually see from, from some panelists that are among us today, you, you can already see that in the sampling of, of those who are, who are here today. Um, so, so why is that exactly? Why do we have such a strong, um, a strong pool of, of expertise in optics and photonics in Quebec? Um, so actually a good way, um, what's important in that regard, is kind of to look at key historical mi milestones that brought the development of the optics and photonics ecosystem in Quebec. So it actually started off with first milestones that are more pillars in terms of research centers and uh, references in terms of expertise. So this would include in 1947, for example, the Department of National Defense, of National Defense which created the Defense Research and Development Canada uh, Center which we commonly know as DRDC Valcartier, which is on the, the military base. 
followed in 1985 by the creation of uh, I know you know, which is the National Institute of Optics. And uh, you know, many will recognize either by name or by logo, which is really a, a leader in text transfer and is also recognized for its active participation in the sector, notably for for its new spin-off companies, um, Teraction being, being one of them actually. And um, so a few few years down the road, 1989, there was the creation of uh, the, the Center for Optics, Photonics and Lasers. So the COPL, which was funded by Université Laval based in Quebec City. But today uh, the COPL has actually become more of a, what we call a strategic cluster. And it regroups eight universities throughout the province of Quebec. So it's a very strong academic um, basin of expertise, but it's also uh, one of the main <laughs> one of the main uh, clusters where a lot of our our, um, our next gen, I would say, of expertise in optics and photonics comes from. And then following this, we have uh, key milestones that were, are more in terms of mobilization efforts that were supported by governments to really to create support organizations aimed at developing the ecosystem further. So in, 20, in uh, 2006, we had the creation of what was called the Réseau Photonique du Québec. So that was actually the creation of a provincial network that was the result of the merger of two regional groups. So at the Quebec City level and at the Montreal level, and I'll speak to that actually in a minute. And uh, now, just a few years ago, in 2017, we had the creation of Optonix, so which is now the province of Quebec's, um, what we call the Pôle d'excellence en optique photonique, so Quebec's photonics cluster, which was the merger again from, from <laughs> two different, actually, provincial associations. So, so we have these key milestones that, that really contributed to making Quebec a key reference um, and making its industry well-known locally, but especially internationally. So I'll finish my presentation a little later with, um, with Optinix's purpose and, it, and its role as it relates to the photonics industry, but I wanted to begin by deep diving into, into the stats to allow for a better understanding of Quebec's ecosystem as a whole. And um, these numbers are, are actually from a study that was carried out in 2019. And as you know, since we, we've gone through a pandemic, but these numbers still remain a pretty good low end estimate of the industry status. So in the whole province of Quebec, we have just over 220 companies uh, in optics and photonics, which contributes to about three, uh, 3 billion of Quebec's GDP. Um, just over 22,000 jobs make up the industry with about half of them being directly related to, to expertise or training in optics and photonics. But the average salary that you see there are all uh, jobs combined in the industry. And for, for those familiar with, with the province of Quebec, you may know Quebec City, for example, as home to the Chateau Frontenac or Montreal as our big metropolitan city. But these are actually also our two economic hubs when it comes to the photonics industry. So um, Quebec City and Montreal are, are actually the photonics industry is, lar are largely, is lar largely um, concentrated in Quebec City and Montreal. So Quebec City is home to about 5,000 jobs in, ph in photonics and Montreal home to about 12,000 jobs in photonics uh, with about leaving about 5,000 5, or just over that scattered in other regions uh, of the province. And in both regional cases, there's really a strong company growth and also significant involvement in, in R&D activities. So just to kind of get a, a better idea of what our companies in optics and photonics do in terms of activities, we have a significant portion, so 78% who are involved in research and development and or manufacturing of innovative photonic products. So this would include, for example, cameras, sensors, fiber optics, lasers and laser systems, LEDs or other light sources. We have about 50% uh, involved in image analysis using in-house uh, in-house developed software. So this could include, for example, image acquisition, image processing, computer vision, and artificial intelligence. Oh, I, I might have mixed up, I think I, for, I, I mixed up the percentage, so I meant to say 42% for that one, and 50%, um, which is the integration of photonic products and or image analysis software in the manufacturing of innovative products. So this would include, for example, LIDARs for autonomous vehicles, cameras for drones, and uh, for example, uh, surveillance systems. 
There's also about 51% um, of our companies who are involved in what we would categorize as consulting, distribution, and or other activities related to, to photonics. So this could be, for example, value-added product resale, testing services, consulting, and, and uh, also service companies. And on average, all of Quebec-based uh, companies are involved in about two types of activities. So within these different types of activities, the most common products and software that we, we tend to see are, for example, software and signal processing, uh, cameras, imaging systems, and sensor arrays. We have uh, sub so sensors, lasers, and laser systems, so LIDAR, and uh, electronics, and microelectronics. And within those different products, the, the expertise the three top expertise that we have in the province are image acquisition and image processing, also control and use of lighting of lasers and other coherent sources, and finally interferometry, spectroscopy, and chemistry. But this is not, just know that this is not an exhaustive list. These are really the most common products and also the most common expertise, but we, our, our companies do have a large range of different um, products and expertise that they offer, which if you're interested, I'll be, I'll be glad to tell you about more. And just to give you a good idea of, of the main sectors that our photonics industry serve, um, number one is life and health sciences. So that means, um, for example, products that will go into medical labs. We have different companies really working, for example, on, on different uh, high precision microscopes. Uh, it can be the development of, diff of new types of infrared, mid infrared lasers, for, for example, uh, laser surgery. We have um, teams in radiotherapy working on scintillation dosimetry who are actually going clinic just this week. Um, uh, and then we also have um, one of the top sectors is the advanced manufacturing. So that would include automation, robotics, inspection, and um, everything related to the 4.0 industry. And finally, aeronautics and defense. But I won't be teaching anyone anything uh, to anyone here today when I say that photonics is an, an enabling technology. So we obviously find its applications and those of our company's product software and services within a whole portfolio of sectors. So actually in Quebec, um, companies serve an average of 3.7 markets, which really makes the industry significantly less vulnerable to, to economic flexions, uh, fluctuations in any uh, one of the markets. So so we'll have um, companies, like I said, we talked about life sciences, aerospace, environment, and energy. Um, we'll have, uh, for example, companies that who, uh, whose lenses or cameras will be used as the eyes in space, in space missions. Or for example, like if we go to arts and culture, uh, if you guys watch the opening and closing ceremonies of um, the Olympics this year, actually, we had one of our our company's Moment Factory, who, who was in charge of the, the, the light technologies that were that light up that lit up the, the Olympic uh, loops, actually. So we talked about the portrait of the industry. We talked about the strengths, uh, the expertise, and the, the sectors in which the companies work. Um, so what is the status of the industry as it stands today? So we have about three out of four of our, com of our companies in the province of Quebec who are in constant growth. Um, companies have a significant, well, like actually we just heard, but have a significant international focus in terms of sale. So we have about 92% of companies who, who, ex who export, and that accounts for a, an average of 66% of their revenue. And just to give you an idea, one out of two companies export to countries other than the United States. So there's a very large international focus, uh, like you can see just from these numbers. And even if I had hidden the last point and I would have asked, what do you think is the, the largest obstacle to company growth at the moment? I'm sure many of you could have guessed that it is, as you could expect, the labor shortage. And speaking of obstacles, um, we can also have a good idea of the, the obstacles to company growth and or to a company's capacity for innovation based on the, the business size, so, so the number of employees here. So like I just mentioned, for SMEs and for large businesses, uh, HR, so, so the need for talent is a critical obstacle at the moment for, um, for, for company growth. And I, I would be ready to, to guess <laughs> that the numbers are actually more important than, than the ones shown here um, as this, the situation stands today. Um, for very small businesses, 
then the obstacle uh, of HR and talent acquisition competes with, with that of funding and acquiring capital. So we talked about the industry, we talked about, um, about the, the different obstacles and also, but also like the, the expertise and the potential that the industry well has already proven, but, but can, also, can also have just with, with everything that, <laughs> with all the companies that, that make it up. And um, this came, like I talked at, I, I spoke to about a bit in the beginning to, um, to the creation of mobilizing or support organizations to help grow and further the development of the ecosystem. And that's actually where Updenic comes in. So back in 2017, uh, the Updenic, which is the, the pole d'excellence en optique botanique. So what would literally be translated as the cluster for excellence in optics and photonics what was created. Um, and it was really born from a, a strong desire for, for different industry stakeholders and, and researchers to really come together and to better promote uh, the photonic se sector around common goals. So the, this idea of creating a cluster <clears throat> was really to, to um, what was a program that's aimed to mobilize and coordinate the, the actions of, of both public and private financial partners around common objectives and common methods of intervention. Um, so, so what we uh, as an organization are, are here to do is to mobilize manufacturers, research centers, educational institutions, so including colleges, universities, and different industry partners in, in, in addressing four strategic vectors. So that includes commercialization, innovation, production, and employability. So how do we go about doing that? And this is just an example. <laughs> but we actually, it, go, it goes quite beyond what you see here. Um, so it can be by lending specialized support when it comes to launching uh, research products, uh, especially between academia and, and industry. Uh, it can be by, by offering personalized or, or specific training to, uh, to, to different companies. So it's, so, so it's about identifying common, common uh, let's say common challenges or, or needs for training, for example, and then, and then being able to coordinate throughout the whole industry. Um, so like I said, training courses, uh, organizing conferences or different, or different projects uh, that, that address uh, sector specific issues. We also accompany, well, we organize and accompany our, our, our different um, companies in, um, in, for example, international trade missions, going to different international conferences and really organizing the, the whole, whole booth uh, within uh, an exhibit. For example, we'll be at Photonics West uh, with a lot of our companies there. Um, so that's one, one of the things we do. And also we talked about employability. So we, we do try to address different issues <laughs> to, related to the workforce development, uh, but we also help in promoting the different job offers uh, that that our companies may have. So this slide is just kind of to show what I call the strategic playground and is probably how I would describe my job to someone like my mom. <laughs> and, then, and when I, I do that, I, I say that Updenic really exists to, to help different, um, help the, the industry better relate to academia, be better uh, in, or better informed government and its funding to the, and, and align that with the needs of the industry and also just just really kind of help all the different boundaries between the different stakeholders be become more permeable. And to be able to do that, we do have the, the help of key municipal, provincial, and federal financial partners in that regard. And what's also interesting to say here, and what, what I show is basically a, a map of, of actually where Quebec is at the international level. So we benefit from an important network, both public and private, and both locally and, and globally. So this is important on one hand for, for example, attracting international talent, but also like we talked about with sales largely dependent on foreign markets, we can use these networks to enable business, um, business applications and opportunities for, for our companies. And um, just like we saw earlier, our, though our companies have strong expertise and capacity at different levels and in different fields, they do share common challenges. So, so we, we do help them um, to, to voice, to voice the, the common challenges and bring forth concrete and structuring solutions or policies that can enable better development and growth for our industry, both in the short and long ter term. So these are just a few examples that are um, available actually on our website. So 
like, like what I'd want to communicate basically with my presentation is that um, Quebec's photonics, photonics industry has a local expertise, but it really does have a worldwide contribution. And uh, Updenic is very proud to be able to contribute to, to supporting our, our companies in that regard. So it has a very strong optics and photonics ecosystem at all the academic, research, industrial levels. Uh, there are key players in the industry who will speak for themselves today, and I'm really excited. I'm always proud to, to hear of their success stories, which can serve as models for other companies in photonics. And if you're looking to collaborate with companies in our network, wanting to learn more about optics and photonics in Quebec, or if you're a student, for example, who wants to work in uh, La Belle Province de Quebec, uh, please reach out and I'll be glad to connect and hopefully collaborate in one way or another. So thank you again for the invitation and uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Madison. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, Madison. Thank you very much for that uh, great overview of uh, Quebec photonics. Thank you, Donna. Uh, maybe uh, I could start off with a question. So, you know, Steve also talked about the great talent pool in, in Canada and you showed, you know, the, the large workforce and yet you've also got this challenge of um, trying to fill, um, you know, positions as well. So what are the, can you talk about some of the strategies that you are, um, Optinique is doing with respect to the universities to try to get more, um, um, you know, young people going into, um, you know, optics and photonics? So actually, we, we, we try to address this at different levels. We try to look at the long term. So how do we just get more, more people just coming in at the, for example, college level and then the university level. So we try to be active actually at the high school level to, to just talk about the field um, because actually, we'll hear how it works. It's when they reach grade 10, I would say, nine or 10, that's when they already start deciding what kind of math courses they'll take and what kind of physics courses they'll take. So, so we do develop partnerships to be able to promote the industry at a very young level. Um, and then later on, we, um, we also work, when I was showing our international partners, we will use those programs like MyTax, for example, as a, as a very big leverage for bringing international talent. So trying to track them first to either our universities or directly to our companies. So that's one of the things that we, we, we use our network for that uh, very much. And um, right now uh, we actually have a task force uh, with, with different members from academia, from industry and from, from the government that are working together to, to identify the challenges and try to see what kind of solutions we can put forth. At the Quebec level, uh, we do have a bit of problem at, with the immigration policies and because of the, the French language, there are certain criteria that new talent have to meet. So we have we can try to see what 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 can be done at that level and, and what could be accommodated uh, down the line. It's a good reason to learn French. <laughs> I'll there be happy any, to help. <laughs> are there any other uh, questions? Um, if you would like to unmute yourself and, and ask Madison directly. I don't see any uh, questions coming in. So thank you very much again. Madison. Thank you so much, Dami. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll move to our, our next speaker in this afternoon session, who is uh, Philippe Bemin, who is a CEO of Eponics. And he is going to be talking about silicon nitride photonics in Canada. So uh, Philippe, uh, I will hand over to you to share your screen. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, being there. My name is Philippe Babin. I am the CEO of Apronics. And today I will be presenting about uh, silicon nitride photonics MEMS. And uh, this presentation will explain the technology, but also uh, the impressive collaborative effort that led to that uh, exercise. The, the journey began in 2014, quite a long time ago, with the encounter of two scientists uh, at the University of Quebec and Montreal and ourselves at Eponics. The initial idea of the two scientists was to combine silicon photonics with MEMS to build an uh, optical coherent tomograph for medical application. Uh, we uh, 
we asked them at that time, well, would it fit for a uh, tunable transceiver? We, we, we were focused on the telecom market at that time. And the answer, well, well, yes, maybe. And we started the collaboration with multiple projects. In Canada, we do have the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, who's offering uh, funding, co-founding of R&D project. But as a member of Optonic, we're also in Quebec having additional funding available on top of the NSERC financing with organizations like Prima Quebec and PROM. So we started the project involving many universities, some on the development, uh, the design with the ETS, Université Laval, uh, and also Concordia. And uh, also on the fabrication, so we start using some of the fabs available at INRS, McGill, Polytechnic, University of Sherbrooke, even UBC uh, with Professor Krzysztofski. So we basically use and leverage everything available. We also have college, and Optech was one of the, pa the partner in that development of the technology. We also use CMC. CMC offer uh, MPW run with some men's foundry. So at the beginning, we were having access. And now more recently, uh, CIPIC Fab is offering kind of similar services across the university. At the point where the, the technology got to a good level, we moved it and start working with the C2MI in Bromo. The C2MI is a wonderful industrialization center. It's the gap between the, the labs, the, the university, and the industry. We find at the C2MI, men's la production line uh, in silicon, everything needed for electronic and optical packaging, as well as reliability testing. We had on top of that partnership, good relationship with Expo and Maple Leaf on the testing level. And also with the novel company, uh, Vanguard uh, Photonics for photonic water pumping. Uh, seven years later, more than $4 million invest uh, into that project. And today we're basically working on the technology with, uh, with the men's foundry. So uh, let's just briefly talk about silicon nitride. Uh, we see on that table a competition of the multiple technologies available starting with silicon photonics, well-known, available in large stainless foundry uh, with around 2 dBs per centimeters. Uh, and, but more recently, and we're seeing uh, more and more traction towards silicon nitride. So with silicon nitride, uh, it's common to see uh, lower losses within the range of 1 dB per centimeters. And it's gaining in popularity thanks to companies like Linux, uh, Ligentex, uh, iMac, Iconics, and Photonics. So it's more and more silicon nitride available. There are other technologies to pull down to lower optical losses in silicon photonic, uh, with, uh, as an example, uh, TIC SOI RIB or on silicon nitride with the uh, varied uh, channel, 10 varied channel. But they're more available on the research level. At Eponics, with the MEMS foundry we're working with, we've been able to push the technologies to uh, offer a standard 0.4 dB per centimeters, uh, very good uh, properties. Uh, silicon nitride is also offering uh, very interesting properties that we'll be uh, showing a bit later on. Um, the bending radius, radius is also a factor uh, with good, good compromise. So being capable to have on the MEMS foundry available with rather uh, narrow waveguide lead to have a good size of chips and dimension. And obviously the fact of working in the men's foundry provide us access to men's. So why uh, integrating, why men's and switches? Integrating silicon nitride with men's is basically on a single die is what we've been doing and developing over all these years. And it does enabling a wide range of applications in the telecom and passive optical network with tunable transceiver uh, as one example. We see also application inside of the data centers uh, using optical, optical, optical circuit switching and also tunable filters are all possible to be done with silicon uh, nitride. 
Uh, plenty of sensors can be supported with this application, but we're seeing also application in the future and moving forward in the fields of LIDAR and uh, quantum photonics. I'll be coming back a little uh, later on quantum photonics. So we're, we have two ways to build the switch on our platform. I'm just taking a moment here to explain the technology on the left side. What we're seeing is uh, traditional 3D mesh to build uh, a switch, an optical switch. In these cases, fiber optic in being collimated to uh, two uh, planes of meter that can be tilted to reroute the path of light toward a given output. 3D MEMS are known, typically switching in the 25 millisecond range, but needs a sophisticated uh, control controller to uh, tune and um, uh, control uh, the system. These systems are also sensitive mechanically and require uh, required isolation or, or um, mechanical protection, uh, leading to a large size and cost. However, the free space nature of the system make it suitable for a wide optical range. In our case, we use planars, more 2D level. Uh, and I'm going to, there's a small video animation here that I'll be running, but basically what you can see is a cell. We have input waveguides on the left side and output waveguides on the right side. We're suspending the waveguide on the platform with springs and electrostatically actuated waveguides. So this enables the platform to move and there's two movements. One is up and down to open and close the gap. And the center, second movement is from left to right to reconfigure the position of the cell. So in this example, we're basically showing uh, a one by two switch. We do have developed one by two, two by two, one by four, uh, uh, on off switch uh, using MEM space. But with the platform similar to silicon photonics, we also have the capabilities to implement MMI, MZI, MMI switchings and filters leading also to fast switching. So our switching time is fairly good in the sub five millisecond range for both mechanical and thermal optic. And uh, in terms of the, of the platform and both of them having a low power. So the novelty is really to control the level of power to a very low level uh, in both thermal optics and lens. Uh, I'd like to use this table here to comment and discuss a little bit uh, before Stephen explain about PICS and the phosphide and uh, uh, silicon photonics. So let's look at silicon nitride. By nature, silicon nitride offer a very nice range of wavelength, okay, covering multiple applications. Uh, uh, so silicon nitride is a nice wavelength range, low loss and also is quite stable thermally. So as an example, you can use silicon nitride to build a multiplexer or demultiplexer very uh, much easier uh, than with silicon photonics. Actually, in the case of CWDN, this is without any thermal control and on the DWDN using microliter that are very efficient. But obviously silicon photonics, on top of being very widely available and low in many foundry, it's also enable two things on, on the modulation. So capacity to do modulation is obviously a benefit of silicon photonics compared to silicon nitride photonics. And also on some platform, it's possible to combine three, five elements like indium phosphide and photo detectors like germanium on the same platform, either by doing a bounding of growing of these material on silicon photonics. This is not necessarily available in all the foundry, requires lots of development costs, and uh, sometimes available only in captive foundry like, like Intel and, and their processes. In PICS, using indium phosphide as an example, is, is quite cool because you can combine laser source detection and the circuitry on a single device, leading to uh, very high density and low cost indeed. However, often there are drawbacks and uh, compromise 
to be done between having a good laser source and a good detector. With silicon nitride, what we've been doing was to be able to do rapid integration of existing off-the-shelf components. So it's basically take a 3.5 SOA or a laser source and build on a silicon nitride platform the integration of this, selecting the best laser source and the best EPDs for a given application. We're talking about hybrid integration as part of the effort, the development of the packaging was also. So uh, in terms of hybrid integration, having the chip is nice, but it's the next step are to couple that with fiber optic. And we develop here the technologies with both passive alignment with U-groove, passive and active alignment with U-groove, quite standard, but also investing in photonic wire bonding. We spent many years to develop on our chip and using the photonic wire bonding fiber attached. And this is a collaboration, by the way, where UBC and Citic 5K played a big play in our history in the development and making off of the technology. For hybrid integration of laser and SOA, again, we demonstrate and develop uh, using photonic wire bonding technologies as part of the platform. While with photodetector and EPDs, we're basically using uh, direct coupling from the waveguide to uh, the EPD or the monitoring photodiode. The next step was to develop as part of the platform anything for control system, uh, making sure that it's leading to a cost-effective packaging and high volume testing. So we basically built a toolkit uh, to develop products and application. Even though one have the toolkit, developing a photonic products is, is a complex thing and it requires lots of know-how and, and in developing these system from a design simulation, often multiple iteration are needed proper integration, assembly test qualification, and building that in everything so it can be ruggedized, robust, and you know having a good reliability fitting the requirement of telecommunication and passive optical network, which was done. So basically the key message here is like here is to say that to build a product really means that full thinking solution and collaboration and working with the right partner is definitively a, a good idea. But to build what? What are the example of application that can be built? Like I mentioned, we focus on, on telecom product, building tunable transceiver for pawn application. Uh, but today I'd like to open up and discuss a little bit about more uh, well, futuristic or next five, 10 years uh, window about the quantum and the role of silicon nitride in that space. Silicon nitride uh, offers several benefit for quantum computing or, or other application, but it's really uh, a good material. First for its high te large temperature range, obviously. And I already comment about the ultra transparency and the capability to support the wide wavelength range. But also on the power level, silicon nitride offers high power thanks to the low two photon absorption of the material. We already comment about, comment about the low noise, low loss, but low loss also need less noise, and which is important for some application. Uh, refractive index of two, make it compatible with chip fiber coupling and hybrid integration, but also something which is less known is the large nonlinear refractive index, low power budget, uh, interesting for uh, quantum application. So like I said, it's more, uh, it's more than, than computing. It's, it's computing, it's communication with uh, encryption and, and, and long distance or short distance encryption for uh, quantum application, but also in the, in the, sense, in the sensing space with uh, multiple uh, sensor application and interest. Again, on silicon nitride for quantum, uh, it's, 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 I'm repeating maybe, but it's a strategic material. The future of quantum technologies will need to be distributed. So most of these com application, computing, communication whatsoever require that level of distribution. The physical interconnects for quantum information processing will require a good level of control, 
And finally, the fragility of quantum information must be dealt with at the material uh, level. At Eponix, we are quite interested uh, to collaboration in that space, in the space of sensors, and uh, basically sensor sensing type of uh, application. As an example, uh, there's many companies working on photonic quantum sensors that utilize entanglement, single photons, and squeeze state to perform extremely precise measurement. So building a device capable to uh, improve the sensitivity by 100x is quite cool and interesting, but it cannot be made at the price of 100 times the cost. So integration is key. And the idea we're bringing to the table in that space is to co-packaging of existing single photon source and single photon detector to build this type of application. Quantum is gaining traction and hype around the world, obviously. And Canada is not a part. There are several initiatives in Canada to support and encourage. Uh, photonics, even more in Quebec, the Quebec government is very strong about supporting investment and project in that space. But what I'd like to say as, 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 as the end is quantum is very complex and it requires complementary competencies uh, to understand the physics and the quantum phenomena. Being an expert in that space, but also in the photonic and packaging space or system-wise is very difficult. So again, areas for collaboration. As a summary, as I hope you've seen, partnerships are definitively enablers of su success, and there's a very strong, solid future for silicon nitride. Moreover, when we're adding on top of it, MEMS and MEMS processes. Integration and packaging creates new opportunities. We saw, look at one example in the quantum space, uh, but clearly in our space, the system thinking and the partnering and working with an experienced partner is definitely uh, a, good, uh, a good idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe, for that um, really interesting overview of um, silicon nitride photonics. Uh, we have uh, time now for um, some questions from the audience. If you would like to either put it into the chat or um, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask the question directly. Uh, there is a question uh, from Matt Posner, uh, Philippe, uh, who asks, how is Eponix managing partnerships and IP protection? And how may these change in future growth stages? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a lovely idea. Often that IP protection has been a roadblock for many industrials to consider a partnership with academia and universities. And it was, I would say in the past, it's, it's easier now, I would say, a very challenging point for all of the investor to be able to maintain that property. So um, two key success factor. The first one is partnering with IP Council that has been doing a lot of it. They are expert. In, in Canada or depending on the region, but also in Quebec that can guide you because they negotiate many of these deals and they have the experience. They know what are the good, you know, they sell many case. So it's really ease on the negotiation. And then the second point is, well, with who? Some, you know, in the past it was more difficult with some universities to manage it. Uh, but uh, now there are some of the university are offer, how should I say, I don't want to say easier or, or more practical business approach. So by doing it properly right at the beginning is fundamental. Then you gain the confidence of your investor as you move forward and you scale, right? So it's really do it right at the beginning take the time to negotiate the IP licensing, the, the contract research agreement, and the IP licensing all together. So when you move up in the, in the chain, you it, it get easier. So the first one is the tougher, but if you're well uh, counsel, uh, it, it'll, it'll go well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, may, this is a Gisela from Interaction. May I ask a question to Please, Philippe? go ahead. Hello, Philip. Uh, uh, 
in, in your presentation, you mentioned or you, you made reference a few times to LiDAR application for silicon nitride. Can you comment on any any specific uh, applications you've uh, you've uh, you've addressed? Yeah, we uh, we actually I saw two companies in in Europe uh, looking at that aspect. So I saw the combination of switching. So uh, and the integration of laser. Uh, and switching out of the silicon nitride platform. So benefiting from the low loss. So it was a capability to do some scanning involving. So hybrid integration of the laser on the silicon nitride platform. In that case, it was not with us, but this is something that we looked at and are considering. And then the, the platform will enable you do, to do a switching and sharing for, for, for sequencing. So uh, I saw one example, I think it's even documented. If you look at IMEC, on their overall list of project, I believe they made it quite public in terms of uh, how the system was working. So that's one example that I saw very well. But really at the point of being able to uh, co-package laser source, laser detection, definitively silicon nitride is a good platform to do this. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Merci, bienvenue. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. So I think we need to move on to um, our, our next speaker. So thank you very much again, Philippe. And I will now hand over to uh, Erin Young, who is going to chair the second half of this session. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Dalma. Uh, my name is Erin Young. I'm from Apple in, um, in California. And it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker in this session, Dr. James Pond, who is the Director of Product Management for ANSYS Lumerical and was previously the CTO and founder of Lumerical, um, the photonic simulation software. So please um, take it away, uh, James. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks also for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, can everybody see my, my screen okay at this point? I'll, I'll take the silence as a, as a yes. yes. Yes, we can. Okay. All right, so um, what I wanted to talk a bit about today is um, give, just give you an introduction to ANSYS Lumerical and then tell you a little bit about some of the more exciting um, and interesting areas of active research development we have going on. Um, and then talk a little bit about the integrated photonics ecosystem. And, and then maybe at the end, just give a few of my thoughts on the overall uh, photonics ecosystem in, in Canada. Um, so, you know, photonics, I think everybody here is obviously clear on, on, on what photonics is. Uh, but I think, you know, when we see it from what our customers are doing in photonics, uh, we, we actually have a really broad range of applications and, and kind of meanings of photonics. So it's worth quickly kind of reviewing what that is. Um, and on the lower left side here, you know, what we see is uh, what we call integrated photonics. And these are typically applications that look a lot like integrated electronics. Uh, so things that look like circuits, they're just photonic circuits, not electrical. Um, and, and these are things that are made in high volume, low ca cost manufacturing foundries, like global foundries, tower jazz, compound tech, and so on. Um, and, and, and they may be silicon photonics or maybe other material systems uh, like indium phosphide or silicon nitride that we just heard about. Uh, and, and then over on the right side here, we've got kind of a, a whole range of nanophotonic uh, applications that can be everything from scattering from rough surfaces to uh, you know, plasmonic studies of resonances and particles for fluorescence enhancement or, or DNA sequencing, to you know, de studying defects on different semiconductor surfaces and how they scatter light. Uh, and then in the middle, we have kind of a whole a gray zone, I would say, which is you know, things like uh, micro LED and LED displays, CMOS image sensors, uh, metal lenses, you know, and, and these are the types of things that are, are manufactured in a lot of the same foundries that do integrated photonics, but the application looks a little bit different, say, uh, you know, not the sort of thing you'd necessarily see represented in a circuit uh, schematic. Um, so we tend to group these things in the gray zone over on the, the nanophotonics side. Um, but this gives you sort of an idea of kind of the breadth of, of issues that we have to simulate uh, at, at ANSYS Lumerical. And these are some of the different application spaces that we cover. So everything 
uh, from the datacom style transceivers that we heard about in the first talk uh, to LIDAR, quantum photonics, uh, process design kit development, sensing, CMOS image sensors, augmented reality, displays, lighting, uh, and metrology and defect detection. And this kind of covers sort of the majority of our application spaces. Uh, now for a bit of uh, history, uh, Lumerical was founded in 2003 in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and over the, the years, we quite rapidly grew to become the, the leading provider of photonic simulation software. And this graph shows the number of patents and publications uh, and presentations that reference the use of our software each year. Uh, and, and in 2019, there were more than uh, almost 2,500, there've been more than 13 and a half thousand references overall to the use of our software. So we've really taken a, a leadership position in, in uh, the simulation of photonic devices and circuits. Um, and uh, I, I think many people here may have heard that uh, we were acquired by ANSYS in uh, April, 2020. So it's been uh, about a year and a half now. Uh, and this is a really exciting uh, development. Uh, we're still, our offices are still based in Canada. And in fact, the team in Canada continues to grow. And, uh, but now we're part of a, of a much larger simulation, engineering simulation company. And, you know, as many problems become increasingly multi-physics, being a part of ANSYS is really uh, an incredible opportunity because, um, you know, when we have problems, say that couple, um, uh, you know, high speed RF with photonics or ray tracing with photonics or semiconductor problems or thermal management in co-packaged optical systems and things like that. You know, we have all of these uh, tools at ANSYS that we can work with to develop really complex multi-physics uh, workflows. Uh, so now I'm just gonna tell you about some of the exciting uh, R&D that we've been doing recently. Uh, this uh, movie that you can see here is uh, showing a four channel demultiplexer designed using uh, topology-based optimization with the adjoint method. Um, and if you were watching carefully there, you saw at the end that uh, the device as it was being designed kind of snapped from something that uh, maybe you'd think you, you wouldn't have any hope of manufacturing to something that could be manufactured. And, and that's a new uh, minimum feature size constraint uh, that, that we introduced to really try to get to manufacturable designs with, with this type of structure. Um, you can see the performance here for this four channel, the multiplexer and the O-band looks, looks really good. And the field plots uh, are really sort of remarkable to see uh, in terms of you know, how something that a human engineer could never have designed is, is, is capable of splitting light in these four channels into the four output uh, waveguides. Um, before we get uh, way too excited about this device, and, and I'd remind you, this is a six by six micron size device, so, so absolutely tiny compared to comparable uh, designs. Uh, this is actually a 2D simulation that we're, we're running at this point, so not something that we can actually build in the real world. Um, and we have also been looking at uh, three-dimensional versions of this, uh, starting with a, a simpler problem, which is just a, a 3D OC band uh, splitter. Uh, so this is full 3D simulation. You can see the SEM of the device that we've had manufactured because we collaborate a lot with um, SciEpic Fab and, and Applied Nano Tools and, and Lucas Kostowski at UBC. And you can see that we were able to manufacture, you know, exactly what we intended, uh, kind of overlaid the, uh, the, the GDS with the SEM here. And we know from simulation that this device is, is going to work with very reliable FDTD simulations here. Uh, we're just waiting on the experimental results of this one to, to provide a comparison. Um, so I, I'm going to shamelessly plug a couple of workshops here that we have uh, in, in this conference. Um, there's one on Monday, uh, it's a workshop on inverse design at, uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific uh, time. And um, that, so, so later on, uh, very soon, it's coming up and there'll be a 30 minute introductory presentation by Eli Blanovich. Uh, I would mention that a lot of the work that we did um, on, the, uh, on photonic inverse design, it started as an open source project uh, that uh, between us and one of uh, Eli Blanovich's uh, graduate students or ex-graduate students, and based on a lot of the work and publications that they've done. So this is kind of a really exciting collaboration and a great opportunity to hear a talk by Eli Blanovich. Uh, that'll be followed by two hour live workshop where you can design 
this exact type of, uh, of Y splitter uh, using a slightly different method. What I just showed, this is shape-based uh, inverse design. But what you'll see is that in a workshop with, of a two hours, you can design a device that's really uh, has the best performance of any device available uh, in, in the world. Um, and the, there'll be a repeat on Thursday. Unfortunately, uh, Eli can't attend on Thursday, but we'll provide some introduction to the theory slides that cover a lot of the ground that he's going to cover later on today. So I encourage you to, if you have the opportunity, to attend that. Um, other work that uh, we're doing recently, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into lasers, gain, and, and active devices. Uh, we have a multi-quantum well solver, and we continue to develop it and, and add more and more features to it. Um, and it, in addition, we put a lot of work into our traveling wave laser model uh, in our interconnect software. And recently, we've added the ability to do self-heating so that now we can correctly simulate the power roll-off that you expect to get uh, based on, on self-heating effects and, and we get good agreement compared to uh, measured results uh, in that. Um, so I, I mentioned about some of the opportunities and synergies that we have with other software at ANSYS. And uh, one of the tools that, that, that they have is, um, is a ray tracing tool called SPIOS. And, uh, and more recently, they've just acquired uh, ZMAX as well uh, in terms of other ray tracing tools. Uh, SPIOS is really interesting because it lets you do scene rendering uh, like what you see here, where you can look at, say, the interior of an automobile or, or, or lighting systems and things. And you can, you, you can do that because you have models that tell you how different surfaces are actually going to reflect light. Uh, now, on our side, we can create and simulate all kinds of, you know, micro nanostructured surfaces uh, that reflect or scatter light in very interesting ways. And so by bringing that information about the surface scattering properties, volume scattering properties into SPIOS, we can, you know, simulate a full system, uh, optical system. So I just wanted to show quickly a couple of examples. Um, this is a design of a plasmonic based heads up display. And the idea is that we can put a, a, a periodic uh, plasmonic array on this windscreen of an automobile to improve the contrast of a heads up display. And not only can we do that, we can make it polarization selective. So polarization and wavelength selective. So we can reflect the right polarization at the right wavelengths. And in the upper right corner here, you can see the really beautiful contrast that we can achieve in the heads up display, even with a fair bit of ambient light. Um, and, and so this is really uh, an exciting type of development uh, of, to look at, you know, what can be done between sort of nanophotonics and macro, macro scale optics. And in a similar uh, uh, way, we can take information that we can calculate about the emissive properties of micro LED and LED, uh, micro LED and OLED displays. And we can take that information about uh, the spectrum and the angle of emission, and we can bring that into a tool like SPIOS. Uh, and from there, we can look at you know, what, what an actual display like a cell phone will look like if you make it out of the pixels that you have designed and simulated and, and do all of this without actually having to, to build the prototype yet. Uh, and in this particular device, you can see that uh, uh, this is an OLED display, which is um, got really good extraction efficiency, but the cost of that is that the colors change as you look at different angles, and you can really see how green this screen becomes as you look at a, at a steeper uh, angle to the device. And you can look at it in different lighting conditions and consider you know, different, different human ages and, and how legible it'll be to different people. Um, so there's a whole lot of really exciting things that we can do uh, as part of ANSYS. Uh, now, I wanted to touch on, as a previous speaker did, uh, quantum photonics. Um, and this is something that we've been looking at uh, a, a fair bit um, recently, mainly in collaboration with the Quantum Matter Institute at, at UBC and, and Jeff Young. Uh, and so, you know, we're very familiar with our interconnect photonic integrated circuit solver with solving photonic circuits uh, classically. And one of the things that we typically do in, in the classical circuit analysis is extract an S parameter for, um, for a circuit, which basically, you know, as we all know, relates the, uh, the input optical fields to the output optical fields. Um, and, and what we're doing now is looking at quantum characterization of those same circuits. And so it's a, it's a lot more complex now because the the quantum input state, uh, you know, can have uh, a, a certain number of photons that can be entangled 
across um, different waveguides. And you know, the effect of the circuit is then to, to create a, a, uh, an output quantum state, again, which may be even more entangled across waveguides or, or modified in some way. There may then be a measurement type of mask, which projects you down into a sub part of the Hilbert space. Um, and, and then you get your, your sort of output quantum state out of this. Now, there's a relationship between the classical S matrix and the quantum S matrix. The quantum S matrix is, it's a nonlinear relationship and the quantum S matrix is much, much larger as soon as you go beyond one photon than the classical uh, S, S matrix. But what's really interesting about this is that we have all this expertise in studying the impacts of manufacturing variations, doing things like Monte Carlo analysis on classical circuits to understand how the S matrices change in the real world when you get things made. And because we can now calculate the quantum S matrix, this allows us to do the same kind of analysis of quantum circuits. And I just wanted to give one example. This is a, um, an interferometer that's used for boson sampling. So this is sort of similar to the types of things that Xanadu does. And in fact, the design we came up with here use the strawberry fields uh, tool in order to calculate the, the basics of the design. But what we're doing on our side now is being able to look at, you know, what's going to happen when all of these directional couplers aren't perfect. And, and so here on the upper right, you can see uh, basically um, a, a, a PDF of, of the, what you're going to get if you have a standard error of, in the splitting ratio angle of, say, 0.01 radians. And so we can understand that impact. And what's really interesting is that um, what, what we see is that different designs that are ostensibly identical from a theoretical perspective, if everything is perfect, uh, may actually be quite different in terms of their real world performance. So some design choices or some implementations when you make certain circuit choices uh, tend to be much more robust against manufacturing imperfections than others. So it's a really kind of interesting area that we're starting to, to get into. Um, now, I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh, integrated photonic uh, ecosystem. Um, and, and this is an ecosystem that's becoming much, much more mature and, and has been you know, continuously maturing, I would say, over the last decade and more. Um, and nowadays, you know, in this ecosystem, we expect to have a PDK uh, when we're going to manufacture something at a given foundry. Uh, in order to build that PDK, it takes a lot of physical simulation and optimization. Um, we need to get a lot of uh, different experimental results and measurements. We need to know a lot about the process and technology and maybe make some changes there. Um, and, and what we find is, you know, even when we have a good PDK, customers still want to be building custom components uh, because that's where a lot of the core IP that, that they can provide is, is often in one or two sort of very differentiating uh, individual components. Um, so those have to be designed, you know, with the same process and technology uh, that, that the foundry provides. And once you have all of these, these building block pieces, we, we need to be able to do schematic capture of circuits. We need uh, um, integrated circuits, so electrical circuit, as well as photonic circuit simulation, as well as co-simulation between those. We need to do things like layout and mass generation, and we need to do verification. And then the whole thing will get fabricated at, at a foundry um, where you, and then, and then after that, there's still the testing stages and so on. So there's a, there's a really huge ecosystem that is required to make all of this happen. Um, and, and we see exactly this type of ecosystem uh, exist in integrated electronics. And, and it's sort of what we see in, in photonics is very similar with, with some differences. Um, what we focus on is physical simulation and optimization. Um, we've, we focus on building up compact models, uh, so the behavioral models that are required for the circuit and system level simulation. And then we focus on that photonic integrated circuit uh, and photonic integrated system uh, simulation itself. So we really kind of uh, have, have the areas where we can excel, and then we're part of this larger ecosystem to provide the, the remaining solution. Uh, just an example of, say, designing a PAM4 uh, device. This is what we would drop in our own schematic editor for, the, for a device like this. We can do frequency and time domain simulation, corner analysis, Monte Carlo analysis, you know, looking at the real imperfections from information we have from foundries. And then when we get to the system level, we work with our EDA partners uh, like Cadence and Siemens EDA. Uh, and here's where we can do, say, with Cadence, the full co-simulation. 
Uh, and I'm going to show this little movie up here of this PAM4I. Uh, and this is, this is from a full simulation, including the electrical driver and the photonic circuit. And what you're seeing shift here is actually the precise timing delays between different electrical signals arriving on different uh, stages of a two-stage Mach sender interferometer. And the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the precise timing is very, very important in order to maintain the signal integrity because the electrical signals have to be offset by a group, uh, uh, an optical group delay between the phase shifters. So you can see the importance of being able to do that full system simulation you know, when you have these very complex timing effects between the electronics and the optics. So um, I've come to my last slide and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, kind of my view on the Canadian perspective. And, and it was very interesting to hear some of the earlier speakers uh, before this. And what I'd say is I think Canada has some really incredible strengths in photonics. Uh, and we've heard about some of them earlier. Uh, we really have leading academic research in photonics and this is spread all the way across the country. Uh, we work a lot with Lucas Kostowski at, at UBC, who's a real uh, leader, but there are many leaders across the country in, in all regions, uh, which is really exciting. There's also fantastic educational programs. I mean, what is provided by SciEpic as an example is, is exactly what, what we need to be generating sort of really high quality photonic engineers. And that's recognized not just in Canada, but also, you know, in the US. I've heard companies in the US talk about wanting to hire, you know, people coming out of something like the SciEpic program um, and, and who take the kind of courses that, that uh, say, Lucas Krastowski is able to offer. Uh, we have a lot of strengths in quantum photonics, and that's spread across the country uh, as well, um, you know, as well as some companies working in it. Uh, we also have prototyping and R&D e-beam foundry capabilities. Uh, the SciEpic Fab, say, where we could get some of our devices manufactured is really a great uh, complement to, uh, to all the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, then there's a lot of entrepreneurship, uh, SMBs, as well as R&D centers of larger companies, and, and again, spread across multiple regions. I mean, clearly, you know, Ottawa and, and Quebec is a huge uh, center for this, as, as we know, uh, and Vancouver as well is great. Uh, and, and there's a huge amount of collaboration between these companies and the academic researchers and things like SciEpic Fab. There's a lot of internships and students moving back and forth. So it, it's a really great ecosystem. And then you add on to that uh, the government labs, the you know, NRC, we've got CMC Microsystems and what they offer in terms of MPW runs, the, the groups in Quebec like INO and Optonique and you know, funding programs that have been mentioned by other speakers as well. And, and we have, of course, I have to say the le leading simulation software, uh, since I'm, I'm here as representative of a simulation software company. Um, but certainly I believe that, that we are leaders. And I, I think the, the point that I want to make is, well, we have all this strength. I think Canada, we know Canada is not gonna provide the entire photonics ecosystem. We're not gonna build a major commercial foundry here, uh, I don't think. Um, and so what I'd suggest, and, and I think we are doing, but we need to continue doing is just focus on our strengths, uh, You know, be the best where we, where we can and, and, and really you know, contribute more than, than what we should be given the country, the size of the country we are, and then rely on and contribute to the larger international ecosystem uh, for the rest. So I will end, end here and see if there are any questions. Thanks very much, James, for your unique perspective. Um, do we have any questions for James? Feel free to um, write them in the chat or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, let's see. I, I think I can see the one of probability distribution functions with tolerances of manufacturing errors. Um, yeah, so in, in this case, so the question is what material technologies, nitride, silicon, silicon, uh, silicates, 3, 5, and so on are supported? And actually, this is basically, we, we can support all of those material systems because anything that has a uh, a compact model so, so that we can do the classical circuit simulation can be used to do the um, to, to do that quantum analysis that that I was showing there. So it wouldn't matter what, whether you built the directional couplers that I showed there out of in, in silicon or, or three fives or silicon nitride, that wouldn't actually matter because um, you know we're, we're building up a full 
uh, classical S matrix extraction of, of the circuit and then going from there to the quantum S matrix. Thanks, James. I think um, we do need to move on now. So thanks again, James, for the nice talk. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker who will be um, Gilain Lafrance from, um, who is the president and CEO of Teraxion. Thank you, Erin, for the introduction. Thank you, Dalma, for the invitation. So I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. I guess you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, I'll be talking about um, you know you see uh, interaction now is a part of uh, Indy Semiconductor, and uh, this was uh, recently announced. Uh, and I'll I'll show you you know how agility and innovation led to this um, latest strategic move from interaction to join uh, to join Indy uh, Semiconductor. So I'll, I'll kind of. Uh, draw a, a, a summary of how we, we got there. So in a nutshell, Teraction was founded in 2000 and we designs and manufacture uh, innovative photonic components. So we are, we are a photonic uh, component company and most of the time we supply components to uh, system vendors. We're uh, roughly 170 employees, uh, most of them based in Quebec City. Uh, uh, the Indy uh, uh, company now with Teraction probably hires uh, somewhere around 450 employees. And as I mentioned, we're now an Indy uh, semiconductor company. So Teraction is, is well known uh, uh, as a fiber bracket grading uh, company, but uh, uh, we're actually much more than that. And uh, uh, we have you know, other technologies that uh, uh, we are uh, mastering and, and 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 building product of uh, such as low noise lasers, mostly semiconductor lasers, and also what we refer to as integrated photonics, uh, mostly here silicon photonics. And I'll show you some example of how how we apply that uh, those uh, those technologies. Hey, we, you, uh, may, you may want to flip your your screen. We're seeing the presenter view, not your presentation view. You don't see my presentation. No, we we see your presenter view. So the split screen where you've got the next slide coming up. Okay. So you know, I'm not sure how to do that. Try the middle, uh, the middle pull down menu up above your slide there. Does that That's allow you? To, uh, yeah, yeah. Does that allow you to switch switch the? Uh, <clears throat> switch did, did, it, did it work or not yet I guess it's not the zoom function. Mm. I'm not sure how to do that here. Parameter de charge, you can switch the screen. Parameter de charge? Sur cette écran-là, tu vois? Oui. Où je trouve parameter de charge? Si tu cliques dessus, il va t'offrir de changer de mode présent, de switcher les écrans. Non. Oh, oui. Je t'essaie de masquer le mode présentateur, peut-être. Est-ce que ça a fonctionné? Oui. OK. Merci beaucoup, Philippe. <rire> J'étais... Euh, on utilise Teams, normalement. Mais enfin, bref. OK. Donc, euh, 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 
on, 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 un marché diversifié pour Interaction, euh, en fait, on, est, on, est, on, est, euh, on était fondé sur la base des, euh, des communications optiques. Euh, qu'on fait tout... <rire> Sorry. <rire> yeah. We... Uh, we, uh, we uh... We, we also have a diversified market base as well because, uh, you know, most of people, people know Interaction for uh, its debut in optical communications, which we are uh, always um, uh, involved in, uh, mostly uh, digital communication, but we also have a small footprint in analog or, or RF over fiber communication. And once again, uh, we, we supply components to this market. Components for material processing, we're talking here about components that are used in high power uh, fiber lasers, uh, CW high power fiber lasers, and also ultra fast lasers, mostly used for um, uh, uh, you know, um, steel cutting, uh, welding, and, and other types of uh, material processing. And uh, lastly, uh, another market we're addressing is components for optical sensing. Uh, two applications there, fiber optic, and also a remote sensing application. Uh, I'll show you in some more details uh, Uh, what we do in, 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 in these markets. So the optical communication uh, uh, path. So we started the company uh, back in 2000 on, on the basis of a shortage of optical components in the, in the industry. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, we had the fiber back gratings technology available to us back then. So we started to uh, 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 develop, uh, you know, fiber back grading based product. We, uh, we developed atermal packages to make them insensitive to, uh, to, uh, to the environmental conditions. And then the products we put on the market back then were gain flattening filters and also DWDN filters. So this was the origin of direction where we started to, uh, to uh, serve the optical communication industry. Then came the 10 gig and 40 gig links. So uh, we refined our FBG uh, manufacturing process Uh, by uh, encrypting the, uh, the complexity of the gratings into uh, the face mask themselves. And this was part of an acquisition we did uh, back then uh, called a company co in California called Fate in Communication. So this, this enabled us to, to write those complex grading. And this is when we introduced the uh, thermal tuning platform that uh, allowed the, the, uh, the, 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 the dispersion compensator gratings to be tuned dynamically To, uh, mainly to address the for, 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 for the uh, 40, gig, uh, 40 gig links. And the products that we put on the market, static dispersion compensators for the 10 gig links and the uh, tunable dispersion compensator for the 40 gig links. Then uh, came the 100 gig coherent, which uh, probably you all know that was not very good for dispersion compensation. So we decided to, uh, to invest in uh, a 100 gig coherent Uh, components. So we, um, we did the acquisition of COGO uh, that were mastering the uh, uh, indium phosphide modulators. And uh, we also uh, invested in silicon photonics to develop our own silicon photonics capabilities at, at Direction. And uh, we also invested in micro optic packaging and uh, the products that we were designing at, at back then were a coherent IQ modulator. So this was the uh, cargo related product and also the coherent receiver uh, that we have uh, worked on uh, back then. And as, um, as we saw earlier uh, today, uh, this was the part that was sold to Siena in 2016. And, uh, but uh, Teraction uh, kept access to some extent uh, to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, mainly the silicon photonics technology for specific applications. And, and we basically built back uh, this uh, capability at Teraction to uh, serve those specific applications. And we'll see uh, some example of that later on. But uh, we, 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 uh, we also invested in uh, developing a, a, a dispersion compensator solution for 100 gig PAM4 and uh, mainly for uh, data center interconnection. And this is something that uh, is available today Uh, uh, we built a, a slope match multi-channel dis tunable dispersion compensator. And uh, we are still supplying this product to the market. And we're also uh, still supplying 10 gig static dispersion compensator, which are a uh, legacy product, but still uh, uh, important revenue generation for Teraction today. So this was the, uh, the uh, telecom path. Now, if we go into how we got into the, uh, the, uh, 
the, what we refer as laser systems. As I mentioned, laser systems for us is two different applications, high power fiber lasers, CW lasers for marking, cutting and welding, and also ultra fast lasers for uh, micro microprocessing application like, uh, uh, you know, uh, most of the common we see is a laser surgery application, for instance. So we, uh, for a high power CW, we enable uh, multi kilowatt fiber lasers uh, because uh, again, based on the FBG technology, we are writing gratings in large, uh, uh, large core diameter fiber. So uh, closely to be multi-mode fiber, 10 to 50 micron core diameter. This is, this is to enable very high power like CW lasers. We also developed femtosecond writing of FBGs. So uh, uh, both uh, through the coating and also uh, the standard way with uh, strip and recall method, but it, this allows us to, uh, to write different types of grading in different core diameters. We also developed heat dissipation packaging because uh, kilowatt fiber lasers is uh, is uh, we you need to take care of the of the heat, and the products that we have put on the market is high power laser reflectors. So these are the reflectors that are put on both sides of the optical fiber, in order to perform the la the laser function. And uh, recently we uh, we uh, released the Raman scattering suppressor with uh, high power into an optical fiber. Um, uh, Raman scattering is, is an undesirable effect, and we have developed a specific filter that to get rid of the uh, Raman emission in order to allow to higher uh, uh, allow for higher power in in those in those laser cavities, single cavity lasers. Then ultra fast lasers, uh, we basically um, uh, uh, took uh, the um, the technology that developed for compensating dispersion in telecom. And uh, we, uh, we modified the process to make them compatible at one micron. So the key in building an ultra fast lasers is to manage dispersion. And uh, interaction has been pretty good at managing dispersion. So everything we, we, we every, all the process we developed at 1.5 micron for telecom, we uh, modified them to be suitable for one micron. And also we, uh, we adapted the uh, thermal tuning platform and we also uh, developed uh, some micro optic assembly capabilities in order, and also the RF electronics to, to some extent control the pulse. And what we do there is that um, you see here our own view of a ultra fast laser uh, value chain. So Teraction has developed components that are used at the oscillator level, components used at the stretcher before amplification, and also components used at, as the um, at the compressor uh, on the compressor side. So this this was a very good, nice example of you know uh, uh, taking innovation from one market and applying it to uh, to a different market. And now uh, we are, are a, a well known supplier of solutions into the ultra fast and uh, uh, CW fiber laser. Now the last market uh, uh, that uh, is the last step for diversification of direction is the optical sensing. When we refer to optical sensing, we have two specific applications, fiber optic sensing, uh, mostly perimeter security, uh, pipelines, uh, you know, fiber used for uh, different uh, sensing, different environmental parameters. And also uh, LIDAR, which is um, uh, used for wind energy and uh, uh, more recently for autonomous uh, vehicle uh, application as well. So, the first uh, technology that is applied there is the, uh, the, the laser frequency control. So this is a, a, a technology that we acquired from Zikas back in 2005. And the first application of this technology was uh, uh, to a program called the ALMA project. So uh, what we did then, we supplied ALMA with a master laser and a set of slave lasers in order to do the uh, photonic distribution of the local oscillator to each and every of the antenna. So this was the first application of the uh, ZCAS technology. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if you visit the ALMA website, then you'll see very uh, uh, impressive images of, uh, of, the, uh, of the sky taken at uh, hundreds of gigahertz of frequency. Uh, so this is something that is already uh, operating. We do also uh, have uh, FBG application. Uh, narrowband FBGs in the optical sensing. You can um, 
think that uh, we we do sensors, but most of most of our FBG solutions are uh, are uh, used in the uh, at the interrog interrogator level, not uh, necessarily at the sensor level. Again, the thermal tuning platform is uh, used for uh, uh, again for uh, tuning those filters. Products we have low noise laser modules that are most of the time used as seed lasers for uh, both the, uh, the LIDAR and the fiber optic and the narrowband tunable filter uh, used to uh, extract uh, or isolate the, uh, the signal itself from any undesirable signal at the, uh, at the interrogator level. So we have also been working on the sensing side on, on a special project, uh, a, a next-gen gyroscope project. So what we have done there is that uh, we've taken the TICAS technology to a next level because we have developed our own uh, semiconductor laser. Uh, it is an intrinsically narrow line with flat FN response laser, which is uh, the low noise uh, behavior is critical in gyroscope and also the flat F uh, FM uh, response because uh, we're using a set of phase lock lasers here. So this FM response, uh, uh, wideband FM response allows us to do a high speed uh, locking, locking loop, very high bandwidth locking uh, phase lock loop, which is critical to, uh, to interrogate the, uh, the gyro fiber. We'll also apply the micro optic assembly because these lasers is combined with a silicon photonics chip. So uh, you see here one representation, uh, lasers uh, packaged with um, uh, silicon photonics chip then coupled to the optical fiber. So uh, this is something that uh, is, uh, enables us to do uh, today, uh, multi-frequency integrated laser source. So you see here, the, there, there are three lasers in there, uh, coupled to the silicon photonics chip, then, then uh, coupled into the, uh, the optical fiber and uh, put on the electronic control board. So this is, this is not something that is at the commercial level. It's still in R&D, but uh, 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 we've been working on this project since 2009. So it shows the application of the technology that was developed in telecom uh, in terms of uh, uh, photonic integration, plus the laser itself to application in the gyroscope. So uh, this, uh, this uh, laser, uh, at the same time of being uh, low noise, uh, exhibit a very uh, high linearity frequency sweeping uh, uh, behavior. In, in, in fact, it is when, when you, you sweep the frequency of the laser, it's much more linear than any other DFB laser. So this, this is a very good fit uh, to, uh, for FMCW LiDAR application because FMCW, you need to scan the frequency of the laser and you detect uh, you use the uh, frequency shift to do the detection. So this combined with uh, micro optic assembly capability again, and um, we have been, uh, we have put together a high linearity DFB laser demonstrator. And now we have started to develop uh, integrated version of this uh, very, very high linearity uh, uh, lasers into uh, uh, with some in uh, instance of multiple frequency as well. So this is how we got, and then, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, makes a link to um, Indy. Uh, Indy Semiconductor is a, a integrated semiconductor and software solution. So what they do is um, integrated electronic chips and they, have, uh, they are uh, active in the, um, in the automotive industry. Uh, they are active in the, uh, for electric car, uh, connectivity in the, within a car. And uh, now they, are, they have a multiple application in, um, in ADAS and autonomous driving. So uh, uh, they want to uh, expand their footprint, not only to the uh, electronic chip, but also to the sensors themselves. And this was uh, part of the, uh, this was the, uh, the reason why they backed their action and, uh, and uh, uh, what they want to achieve here. So they are developing a, a, a FMCW LiDAR uh, signal processor and uh, their action will be responsible to build the uh, optoelectronic front end of the LiDAR itself and combined with the scanner and the power management, uh, this will uh, enable indeed to have a footprint in the FMCW LiDAR uh, product using the, uh, the direction uh, optoelectronic front end. So in summary, uh, uh, we, we, we 
we started from an FBG based uh, telecom company and we became a multiple technologies and multiple markets uh, business model. And where are we heading? Uh, laser systems, uh, we see horizontal expansion opportunity both in ultra fast and high power segments. In optical sensing, we'll formalize the product offering in the gyro and also in the, um, in the uh, FMCW LiDAR. Of course, in the it will be an accelerator for this, for this, uh, for this plan. And uh, telecom, we see opportunities emerging to capture 5G and access rated opportunities. So this means that the intent here is to have Teraction uh, uh, continue its operation and accelerate in specific uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of our strategic plan. And we will apply the same recipe, internal Olympic innovation, uh, so meaning organic growth, We'll work closely with customers, with the specific customer programs as well, and we'll use inorganic m and growth. You've seen that uh, in the past it has served us well, so we intend to uh, continue to, uh, to look at uh, inorganic m and opportunities as well to, uh, to accomplish the plan. So uh, this was uh, the presentation. I'm uh, fully available now for any question you may have. Do we have any questions? Um, feel free to unmute yourself or put the question in the chat. All right. Um, since we are, oh, we have a new message. We have a question. What opportunities are you aiming at in Access 5G other than data centers? This is uh, this is early stage for us, but uh, we we see some uh, specific niche application uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, longer uh, uh, access link operating at fifteen fifty, uh, and there may be uh, opportunities for dispersion compensator there. Uh, as I mentioned, niche a niche application, but we have started to work with a few customers. Uh, in, in specific application. And we were also part of a, uh, of a, of a standard on SuperPON. So we see that uh, in the future, uh, opportunities may, uh, may come uh, to uh, apply dispersion compensation in, uh, in those applications. Great, thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will move on um, to our next speaker, but thank you again. Um, we are running a bit behind schedule. I just want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and um, the recording will be available um, after the, um, the conference is over until November 4th. So if you do have to leave for another session, you can come back and catch uh, Doug's talk and the recording. So, um, and we do have flexibility to go over. So um, I'd like to introduce our last speaker of the session. Um, that is Doug Altin, who's the vice president of Lumentum. So please take it away, Doug, thank you. And we can see your talk. Doug, you're uh, muted still. Yeah. Okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Let me just share my screen again. Okay, so thanks everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, the opportunity to uh, to talk with you today, Aaron and Delma, and certainly thank you to Steve, Madison, Philippe, James, and Justlan for uh, for their presentations. I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about Lumentum and what we do in Lumentum Canada specifically as it relates to photonics. And uh, you know, the first uh, uh, thing I'll talk about is is we pride ourselves in in having a leadership. Uh, position in, in certain areas of the, optic, of the optical domain and, and you know, sustained leadership in any uh, particular endeavor requires three things. It requires a certain level of expertise. It requires a constant learning ecosystem and it also requires time. And 20 years is a long time, but as uh, I'll quickly walk you through some of the material here, you'll get a perspective on uh, what we've been able to do in that 20 years plus. So first of all, who's, uh, who's Lumentum? So this will give you some numbers, but uh, for those of you who don't know, in 2015, JDSU split into two companies, Lumentum and Viavi. 
the Avi assumed responsibility for JDSU's test and measurement business, and Lumentum assumed responsibility for optical communications and commercial lasers, uh, and then what would subsequently become our 3D sensing diode laser business. So about almost, you know, moving towards $2 billion, uh, 5,500 employees, the majority of those employees are in our manufacturing locations in Asia, uh, significant patent portfolio, uh, and, and leadership positions in both optical communications and in uh, data center laser chips, and as well as uh, 3D sensing diode lasers. So I can tell you that we've shipped over a billion uh, 3D sensing diode lasers. So that's a, that's a pretty large number by, uh, by any standard. But let's, let's kind of dial it in and, and talk about what, we, uh, uh, what some of the products are that drive kind of differentiation in, uh, uh, with us in, in Lamentum Canada. So if you take a look at the, the box that I've highlighted is, is the box that, that uh, uh, I manage from a, a, a business perspective. And, and if you look at what, what we call telecom transport, line cards, gray boxes, uh, and the sweet spot is really here, optical modules. So wavelength selective switching modules and amplifier modules. And across all of the, the, the pictures on this chart, you see the portfolio of products that we get to draw upon. So, so we are reasonably well vertically integrated, but we also get to draw upon technology and adjacent technologies within the Lumentum family of products. And we also leverage that technology to drive into, uh, into markets that are slightly different, if you will, than, than our traditional markets. So, so if you think about it from a product portfolio perspective, as I said, we're heavily focused in Canada on optical modules and subsystems. So we have design capability and a whole bunch of materials and processes like indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, silicon, silicon, uh, as well as uh, MEMS and LCOS. We design into our own foundries, which may be in the US or in Asia or in Europe. Uh, we also uh, use partners to, uh, to drive uh, in, in specific instances around uh, MEMS and LCOS. So we, we operate in a hybrid model. And that, by the way, is how we operate from a manufacturing point of view as well. We make some of our own products, but we also work with contract manufacturers. Uh, we really specialize in integrating uh, these technologies into optical modules and further into line cards and, and subsystems. Uh, and, and wavelength selective switching and optical amplification and the novel integration of those two technologies is really the sweet spot uh, for where Lumentum Canada focuses a lot of its attention and, and resources. So let me give you more of a snapshot. So we've got over 220 R&D professionals, engineers, scientists. That's, that's across a portfolio of, uh, or sorry, not a portfolio, but across a population of over 350 people in our uh, Ottawa office. About 220 of them are, are in the R&D uh, domain. Um, and uh, basically we have, um, world-class uh, design capabilities in uh, optical, including free space optics, MEMS design, LCOS design, the ability to bring that together with software and firmware, electronics, PCBA design, uh, mechanical design as well. And you know, the thing that I will tell you is, is um, being able not just to design the product, but to be able to design the manufacturing process to build these products uh, with quality, with reliability, and in volume is, is uh, super important. Uh, you know, we also, across those uh, 220, we have 220 or so R&D professionals. We also have a fairly extensive outreach program to many universities across the country. And in any given semester, we'll have something uh, between 30 and 40 co-op students uh, who are working primarily in STEM uh, programs, but but to a smaller extent in business programs as well. So, so we do reach a, a broad number of universities, and we have a very strong uh, pool of uh, student talent that uh, we we try to turn into, um, you know, early career hires once they uh, once they join the workforce and finish their uh, their schooling. We've got close integration with our R&D centers outside of uh, Ottawa. We actually have R&D centers in, uh, in the United States, in China, and in Thailand uh, that, that we particularly draw upon. 
Uh, and we've got a fairly comprehensive uh, capability in our own facility in terms of prototyping lines, uh, process development, hermetics, alignment, the kinds of products that we're talking about are, are susceptible to, uh, 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 well, very precise levels of alignment, and they need to be reliable over an extended period of time. So, so not just being able to develop the technology, but being able to uh, ruggedize it and make it reliable is, uh, is super critical to, uh, uh, to our business. From a patent point of view, you know, over 75 uh, inventors uh, come out of our offices here in Canada and, and have contributed to that patent portfolio that I showed you on uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, and about a third of the pen, pending US patent applications that we have outstanding right now are, uh, are list Lumentum Canada as, uh, as inventors or co-inventors. And it's across not just the, the technologies that, that I spoke about, but across a broad, spectrum of optical technologies, wavelength selective switching, obviously, uh, but also silicon photonics, uh, gallium arsenide and indium phosphide components, uh, transceivers, passive components, uh, PLCs and waveguides, amplification, uh, SDN elements, and, and uh, increasingly in 3D sensing. So really important uh, that, that we continue to drive our rich patent portfolio. It kind of is the cornerstone of our business. Uh, extending and expanding that portfolio is, uh, is really important to us. Uh, the, other, the other point I'll make is, is uh, cross-fertilization is, uh, is extremely important. So lessons that we learn in one technology or in one market are, are able to filter back and, and help us in other markets. So gradings that we develop for our wavelength selective switches enable us to do filters for 3D sensing applications, as an example. And that's, uh, that's super important in terms of being able to strengthen and develop our, our core technology. Let me give you uh, a, a kind of an example or a snapshot of, of uh, some of the technology that we're involved in. So uh, our goal really is, is to improve the cost uh, per terahertz per degree uh, for our wavelength selective switching. Uh, products and that really is is putting more functionality, being able to switch more uh, optical channels in smaller and smaller footprints that consume less and less power. You know, and reliability is also very important. Steve mentioned single digit fit rates in his presentation, and while we're not there uh, in products as complex as these uh, integrated devices, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, that our reliability and our fit rates, our rates continue to improve and, and are uh, industry leading. So that's, uh, that's certainly important as these products become kind of the work engines for next generation optical networks. This is just a quick example of a, of a next generation wavelength selective switch. And it represents kind of the highest level of hybrid integration. And when I say hybrid integration, what I mean is multiple switching engines, one LCOS, uh, one, uh, one MEMS, uh, combined with uh, significant free space, space optics design. Uh, our, our internal project name for this product was Skyline, and you only need to look into an open, uncovered module from, uh, from above, and it represents uh, the skyline of a major city in, uh, only in miniature. It's quite amazing. Uh, you know. Um, how do you fit this stuff uh, into uh, a small, uh, smaller, smaller form factors is important, but but you also have to deal with some of the what I would what I would say is maybe the more mundane things like uh, how do we make sure that that it's hermetically sealed so it it can last and operate over uh, ruggedized conditions? Uh, how do we manage the number of fibers involved? We're talking about almost seventy fibers that need to be spliced and managed in this particular configuration. So it's extremely important that we, uh, we drive and leverage capability and technology as these solutions become more and more sophisticated. And, uh, you know, this product has been in uh, volume production for over two years now, and uh, it's really starting to transform next generation optical networks. But the other thing that I think is really important, uh, and I'll, I'll bring your attention to, is, is leveraging uh, what, what we call technology adjacencies, and, and other speakers talked about it, but technology adjacencies are really important. Uh, leveraging technology, in this case, free space optics, 
uh, and switching uh, to leverage new markets. And in this example, we're, we're showing a, uh, a LIDAR a LOSA, if you will, or a LIDAR optical subassembly, which is, of course, everybody in optics needs to be doing something with LIDAR these days. Uh, but it, it allows us to share not just design know-how, but also manufacturing know-how uh, to provide access to new products and to new markets. Uh, you know, as, as we say to customers who tell us there's lots of companies who can do this, uh, there's lot, what I would uh, argue is or suggest is there's lots of companies who can build small volumes. There's far fewer companies who can build these products in, in volume with the level of quality and reliability that's required. And you know, uh, LIDAR is, is just one example. We're also doing exploratory work in spectroscopy and metrology that can leverage a lot of the capabilities that, uh, uh, that we have in our product portfolio. But let me turn it back to the people side of things because this is really important as well. You know, in order to be around for the long term, you have to have an environment where people want to come and work with you. And you have to have an environment where people want to stay when they're with you. And you know, we've been uh, lucky enough to, to be awarded the, uh, the, the National Capital Region or the Ottawa Region's top employers for many years, uh, Canada's top employers for recent graduates for many years. Uh, we have leadership positions uh, in the volunteer community in Ottawa, which makes us very proud. And I, I am going to uh, shameless, shamelessly tell you that, that uh, during this COVID pandemic, we turned our cafeteria into a uh, a tool that we could deliver uh, so far over 35,000 meals to at-risk members of the community, and we continue to do that. So, so it's really exciting. The technology is really important, but making feel, people feel they're part of the community is, is, uh, is equally important. My last slide is, is around corporate social responsibility. There was discussions earlier about, you know, how do you make products with using less resources? Uh, how do you make sure that the products that you produce consume less resources. I can tell you that we have a very expansive corporate social responsibility uh, mandate to get to net zero emissions by 2030. Uh, and I won't walk through all the details, but it's certainly a very important uh, part of what we're doing, uh, making sure we've optimized our supply chain, uh, making sure we, we eliminate uh, harmful chemicals, so it's, it's a, a broad approach and it's uh, certainly important in order for us to be, we believe a responsible corporate citizen that, uh, that will take us to uh, the next generation of leadership. So I moved through that quickly because I know we're a little late, but, but uh, that's what Lumentum Canada is all about. And uh, thank you for, uh, for listening. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, appreciate that nice overview. Um, do we have any questions for Doug? Please feel free to unmute yourself or um, write the question in the chat. Any questions? Um, you mentioned LIDAR, uh, Doug. Um, are, is that a, a big area of focus for uh, Lumentum? 3D sensing area is, is a big area of focus for, yes. for Lumentum. And, and LIDAR is one of the areas that we're looking at. Uh, a variety of different uh, technologies, um, not just uh, um, FMCW, but also uh, VIXEL-based LIDAR, short range and long range. So there's a lot of work going on here. I mean, one of the challenges with some of these technologies is they tend to have long uh, cycles, especially as you get into the automotive industry. But it's certainly an area that we are, uh, we believe we've got a lot of the technology in our toolkit that uh, will allow us to address. So it's an area we're excited about. Great. We have another question in the chat. Um, how is the financial health of the optical component industry? Well, you know, the optical component industry went through a lot of reconciliation, shall we say, over the last 20 years. So if you ask me between 2000 and 2010, I would say it was really tough. Today, I would say the companies that, uh, that remain standing are reasonably healthy. Uh, you can take a look at our financial results. They're public. Uh, we're, we're very strong financials. Uh, so the industry, I would say, overall has, uh, 
has rebounded. It's taken quite some time, but it's rebounded and is uh, relatively healthy, I would say. Aaron, can I ask Doug a question? Uh, you you showed the the different areas, you know, market market pieces for Lumentum from devices all the way through to subsystems. Uh, you know, going forward in the future, is there a particular sector that you're you're planning to focus on, or are you going to continue to to really be in in all of those um, areas? Now, I think the the value proposition that we have is really about diversification. Uh, that's that's certainly extremely important. Uh, but but really bringing it back to to light and and what we can do with the power of light. Uh, so you know it, it may surprise people, but the, the the laser that we use to drive an optical amplifier is not particularly different than the laser we use to drive a kilowatt fiber laser. We just gang a whole bunch of them up. So so from a core technology point of view, uh, I think uh, we see a lot of uh, opportunities in uh, uh, the markets that we're in, but also in new markets where we can expand that uh, that technology into into what we call adjacencies that historically we haven't looked at. So we're we're pretty excited about that. Thank you, Great. Any additional questions? All right. If not, I'd like to thank Doug and all of our speakers again and remind everyone that um, this session has been recorded and it will be available until November 4th on the um, Underline website. I think there so, was one final question, Erin, that just oh, came sorry. in the chat. I see that. Okay, sorry. I just see it now. What are the prospects of 3D printing for photonic industry? Question for Doug. I'm not sure that I can give you a, a good answer, quite frankly. I think uh, 3D printing has got a tremendous, uh, I think, a number of opportunities, uh, specifically around photonics. Uh, we do use uh, 3D print printing in our uh, prototyping phase, um, but uh, you know, I don't know that we see a lot in terms of, uh, uh, aside from a tool in our toolbox to, uh, to uh, help product development. Uh, maybe some of the other uh, speakers can can talk more uh, eloquently about uh, 3D printing per se. Sure, if anyone wants to jump in, feel free. No. All right. Well, in conclusion, it seems the Canadian photonics industry is in very good health. And um, so again, thank you to all our speakers for the really nice overview of the Canadian photonics landscape. And um, thanks to the attendees and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>